it's Emerita's birthday this week, but since the 4th of July is well known, let's look at less celebrated events. On July 1, 1904, the third games of the modern Olympiad kicked off in St. Louis, Missouri. Originally slated for Chicago, St. Louis lobbied for the games to be held in conjunction with their Louisiana Purchase Exposition. Despite the lovely setting, the games were not a success. There were few competitors. Of approximately 630 athletes, about 530 were American. Given those numbers, it's not surprising the USA won a near sweep of the medals, including for tug-of-war. Lowlights of the games included a dangerous marathon that the temporary winner won by hitching a ride. Women were only allowed to compete in archery, though there was a women's exhibition boxing match. The games also featured a horrific racist sideshow called Anthropology Days, where indigenous people from around the globe competed to show their fitness in relation to white competitors. The 1904 Olympics did bring to light an extraordinary star athlete in American gymnast George Iser, who won six medals while competing with his wooden leg, and that's something to celebrate. July 2nd is all about the Anthonys. The Susan B. Anthony dollar coin was released on July 2nd, 1979. Anthony, a crusader for women's voting rights, was the first woman to have her likeness on a circulating U.S. coin. Many argued that the time was long past for a prominent American woman to appear on U.S. currency. President Jimmy Carter agreed, saying, The Anthony dollar will symbolize for all American women the achievement of their unalienable right to vote. Unfortunately, the coin wasn't popular with the public because the coin's size and color was so similar to the quarter that consumers kept mixing them up. The last Anthony coins were minted in 1999. On July 3, 1844, the last pair of great ox were killed on a tiny island near Iceland. The flightless seabird, seen here in an Audubon painting, stood erect at about two and a half feet. They were awkward on land, but could torpedo gracefully through the water, dive to great depths, and hold their breath for up to 15 minutes. Some fishermen called them penguins, though they weren't, and others called them garefowl. They bred along the edge of the northern Atlantic Ocean on rocky islands. The great auk had no natural defenses, trusted humans, and laid only one egg at a time, traits that made the lovely bird easy prey for hunters, who slaughtered it into extinction. Which brings us to the 4th of July and the deaths of two American political rivals. On July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary of American independence, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died within hours of each other. The former presidents had worked together to craft the Declaration of Independence, but their political differences led to a bitter feud. They each believed in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but they had different opinions about how to achieve them. Jefferson, a Republican, served as Vice President under Adams, a Federalist. That experience and a slanderous campaign against each other left them unwilling to communicate for years. But during their retirement, they began a 14-year correspondence in which they exchanged more than 185 letters and tried to work out their differences. On July 4, 1826, the 90-year-old Adams died at his home. His last words were, Thomas Jefferson survives. He was wrong. The 83-year-old Jefferson had died at Monticello about five hours earlier. On July 5, 1971, the legal voting age in the U.S. was lowered from 21 to 18 with the signing of the 26th Amendment to the Constitution. The push to lower the voting age began during World War II when people argued it was unfair for an 18-year-old to fight in a bloody war but not be able to vote. But it took until the late 60s with the U.S. embroiled in the Vietnam War for change to happen. President Nixon strongly favored lowering the voting age and public support for a constitutional amendment was high. The 26th Amendment was ratified by the states in record time. 
President Nixon said he believed the young generation would infuse into this nation some idealism, some courage, some stamina, some high moral purpose that this country always needs. He won re-election in 1972 when 55.4% of eligible youth turned out to vote, still the highest youth turnout in election history. Ahoy, maybe. On July 6, 1699, the pirate Captain William Kidd was captured. Kidd was born in Scotland, but lived in New York with a wealthy wife, nice house, and powerful friends. He began his career as a pirate hunter and privateer after receiving backing from rich friends, including Lord Bellamont, governor of New York. Kidd was given permission to protect English ships by attacking French ships and pirates. He had some trouble at sea, though, including murdering a member of his crew, and when he attacked a ship sailing under French papers but with an English captain, Kidd was labeled pirate. Stopping along the way to bury treasure, he sailed home to New York to ask Lord Bellamont to help clear his name, but his friend wouldn't help. Captain Kidd was arrested on July 6th at Bellamont's home, sent to an English court, and found guilty of piracy and murder. Dead men tell no tales, but some say Kidd's treasure remains undiscovered. The legend of buried treasure inspired, among others, writer Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Treasure Island. On July 7, 1802, The Wasp, America's first comic, was published. Not that kind of wasp. This kind. The Wasp was a small political publication that used illustrations which explains why it's considered a comic. It existed to attack Thomas Jefferson. Which brings us back to these two. The Wasp was written by Robert Rusticote, a pseudonym for Harry Crosswell, who was a Federalist and fan of President John Adams. The comic was so offensive that a criminal libel case was brought against Croswell, but luckily he had a good defense attorney in Alexander Hamilton, who argued that Croswell was only reporting the truth, and truthful statements should never be found defamatory. Hamilton's shot paid off when the New York legislature wrote his legal argument into law. Thanks for listening, and join us next week for more Bite Size History.